Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and thank you for making the best arrangements possible today to ensure that as many members as possible can ask questions, but also that uh, the Government is held to account, which is what the function of Parliament is. Many more people will be mourning the loss of loved ones as a result of coronavirus uh, this week. Our hearts go out to all of them and to those suffering from the disease at the present time. Across our country, people are working day and night to keep us safe, fed and warm. Our wonderful NHS staff, police, firefighters, prison and probation workers, teachers, civil servants, local government staff and social care, all of them are showing the value of public service. They are the unsung heroes, keeping the transport system running, the post delivered, utilities running and our supermarkets properly stocked. I'd like to pay special mention to one group that are usually ignored, forgotten and decried as unskilled workers. Cleaners all around the country and in this building are doing their best to keep our places hygienic and safe. Over the past few weeks, I've asked the Prime Minister many times what action is being taken to ensure testing is being prioritised, and I've received assurances that everything that could was being done. Yet, Mr Speaker, a leaked email shows it was just three days ago that the Prime Minister wrote to UK research institutes to ask for help, saying there was no testing machines available to buy. Why wasn't this done weeks ago, if not months ago, when the government was first warned about the threat of a global pandemic, and what, does, what action is now being taken to get testing machines? Mr Speaker, perhaps I could uh, begin by pointing out that this is the Right Honourable Gentleman's last uh, Prime Minister's questions, and it would be appropriate, I think, for me to pay tribute to uh, him uh, for his service to party and, indeed, to the country over the last four years in a very difficult job. Uh, we may not agree about everything, but no one can doubt his sincerity and his determination to build a better society. And I want to pay particular tribute and thanks to him and all his colleagues for their uh, cooperation in the current uh, emergency as far as possible across party lines. I agree with him uh, very much about, in what he said about cleaners. Uh, they do an extraordinary uh, job and they des deserve all the protection and support that we can give them in this difficult time. And on testing, uh, he, is, he is quite right that testing is vital to our success in beating the coronavirus. And as the Health Secretary has explained many times, we are massively increasing our testing campaign, going up from 5,000 to 10,000 uh, to 25,000 a day. And uh, in answer directly to his question, uh, this has been a priority of uh, this government ever since uh, the, the crisis was obviously upon us, like, for weeks and weeks. Jeremy Corbyn. I thank the Prime Minister for his very kind remarks. Um, I believe in a decent, socially just society. And he was talking as though this was a sort of obituary. Just to let him know, my voice will not be stilled. I'll be around, I'll be campaigning, I'll be arguing, and I'll be demanding justice for the people of this country and indeed the rest of the world. We can only protect the health of us all, Mr. Speaker, if we protect the health of our carers. Yet the charity Sue Ryder, who provide care to people with neurological conditions, have said that their workforce is depleting daily as they have no access to tests. When will all the social care staff have access to regular testing? They are very, very important and obviously very, very vulnerable in this crisis. Is it, he's entirely right. I don't, I don't want to repeat what I've just said, except to say that social care staff, in common with NHS staff and indeed uh, other uh, public sector workers, uh, need to be tested as fast as possible. And uh, the answer is, to his question is we will do it as fast as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. All I can say to the Prime Minister on this is please make sure you make yourself available for scrutiny by this House and by everybody else, because we represent people who are desperately worried about their health, about their economic well-being. And if you're living in a small flat and you're told to isolate and you have a large family and a large number of children, the levels of stress are going to be huge. 
The levels of stress throughout our society are huge. It's up to all of us to do what we can to reduce those levels of stress and obviously bring this whole situation to a conclusion as quickly as we can. So we need clarity, not confusion. We need delivery, not dither. This crisis shows us, Mr Speaker, how deeply we depend on each other. We'll only come through this as a society through a huge collective effort. At a time of crisis, no one is an island. No one is self-made. The well-being of the wealthiest corporate chief executive officer depends on the outsourced worker cleaning their office. At times like this, Mr Speaker, we have to recognise the value of each other and the strength of a society that cares for each other and cares for all. Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I, I really want to do nothing else except to associate myself fully with the, uh, the closing words of, of, the, of the Leader of the Opposition. And uh, I think that uh, what this country is doing now is utterly extraordinary. Uh, we are coming together as a nation in a way that I have not seen in my lifetime to help to defeat a disease and to help save the lives of many, many thousands of our fellow citizens. And we all understand that that will involve a sacrifice. But we're gladly making that sacrifice. And the most important point I can perhaps make to the House today is that that sacrifice is inevitable and it is necessary. But the more we follow the advice of the government, the more strictly we obey the measures that we have put in place, then the swifter and more surely this country will come back from the current crisis, the better we will recover. And so I just repeat my message in case uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman would like to hear it one more time. The best thing we can do is stay at home, protect our NHS and save many, many thousands of lives. Yeah. Can I just say and wish the Leader of the Opposition well on his final question? And can I say to the Prime Minister, you have the wishes of everyone to make sure this country gets through this. Yeah. We now come to the ministerial statements. The Lord President of the Council, Leader of the House of Commons, Jacob Rees-Mogg, on the business. And I'm delighted to see that the Leader of the Opposition is back in his place, so I too may pay tribute to him. Um, I perhaps have a particular admiration for him, which may surprise him. Because when I was first elected to Parliament, <laughs> it already has, he says, but when I was first elected to Parliament, there was a distinguished figure who sat at the far end of the opposition benches, was in Parliament the whole time, spoke very regularly, and was a very, very committed parliamentarian. And then he became leader of his party. As a new MP, I sat on the far side of my own benches observing affairs, and though I do not have the level of ambition of the Honourable Gentleman, I too ended up on the front benches, so it seems that those corners are good ones to sit in. But there is a principled point behind this, if I may add, Mr Speaker, that those of us who sit in those far reaches of the House are often very independent-minded and have a great commitment to public service, which the Right Honourable Gentleman unquestionably has, and strong principles about how we think this country may be better governed. It is no surprise to anybody that the principles held by the Right Honourable Gentleman and by me are different, but they are both committed to ensuring the good government of this country. And I think the model he has shown of how a backbench member may make an enormous contribution over many years and may then lead his party with distinction is one that should be remembered. Principles in politics are fundamental to how we do what we do and how we achieve it. So this is a most sincere tribute to the Right Honourable Gentleman, and I note from what he said to the Prime Minister earlier that this is not retirement, it is merely moving to a different part of the front bench uh, in a few weeks' time. Um, I reiterate the Right Honourable Lady's thanks. Well, I understand, I understand that's what's been, been asked for, and ask and, it shall be, ask and it shall be given, seek and you shall find. Um, the Right Honourable Lady <coughs> is absolutely right to pay tribute to all the people who have kept the House operating, who have done a really terrific job. I think the security teams, the doorkeepers, and as the Leader of the Opposition said, the cleaners have really worked marvellously well to ensure we are operating, and of course the clerks, and the flexibility that is being shown in ensuring uh, that um, 
scrutiny may continue uh, via select committees. And finally, uh, the Right Honourable Lady wished everybody good health. It is very interesting. We always ask people how they are, as a normal courtesy, wandering about our daily lives. At the moment when we make this inquiry, we really mean it. And so I too wish everybody good health.